Okay, so we're just going to go briefly over the H-1B visa. Again, the idea is that you've already applied for your H in this uh, last lottery. Um, what is the H-1B visa? It's a non-immigrant visa that is going to allow foreign workers to be employed. And the period is for three years at a time, but up to six years maximum in a specialty occupation for a specific U.S. employer. That would be the entity that would be petitioning the foreign worker. So then, what is a specialty occupation? By definition, it requires highly skilled, specialized knowledge and a bachelor's degree or higher degree or its equivalent. So oftentimes, you'll hear the Ford equivalent in a specific specialty um, as a minimum for entry into the occupation. It's got to be a specific field. Um, just on a side, for example, a lot of, uh, for a while, the Master's in Business Administration was sufficient. But then we saw USCIS caught on a trend saying the MBA, just a general MBA, is not specific enough. They wanted a more specific field to meet this definition. So um, the H-1B visa is always getting some kind of attention. Um, again, the H-1B visa overview, U.S. bachelor's degree or foreign equivalent. And for physicians, you want to also have the full state licensure um, or if it's required to practice in that state of um, uh, for employment. In some states, they actually require that you secure the visa before they'll issue the license. So it's a little bit of the chicken or the egg, which one comes first. But, you know, by depending on the state, we know already how to work with them it, for the physicians. For non-physicians, um, again, bachelor's degree or higher or foreign equivalent. Or you can also use um, education, progressive experience in that specific field, oftentimes referred to the three to one uh, rule. Again, this is just for H-1B. If you have uh, any background in H and, and looking at PERM, you'll know that that rule doesn't apply in the permanent uh, immigration track, the PERM track, but that it would be for an entirely different seminar. So where do we get these numbers? Um, H-1B has numerical limitations and it's based on the fiscal year. The quota is 65,000 new H-1B visas per fiscal year um, excluding the FTA countries, and then they allot additional 20,000 for people who hold a U.S. master's degree or higher. So if you were educated for your master's program or Ph.D. program here, um, you would fall under the master's cap. Um, this applies for first-time H-1B only. So if you were previously uh, included, you, you're already counted towards the cap. And this, of course, numerical limitations would, by obvious reasons, would not in be included for cap-exempt employers. Um, the numerical limitations for this upcoming fiscal year have been met. The window for cap uh, opened April 3rd and closed April 7th. Uh, the announcement went out early that Friday morning, um, but if you had your petition received between Monday or Friday of last week, you were you are in the lottery. Now, we don't have the final numbers. They're set to probably uh, announce the numbers this week or the following week. I'm, I'm so sorry. It seems like there are some people that are not able to hear right now. Um, we're going to see if we can just restart this really quickly, if you guys can give us a moment. Um, if anyone is able to hear on the line right now. If you could please uh, raise your hands or uh, motion that uh, you can hear us because uh, apparently we're having some problems with our audio. Okay. We're trying to work it out. Sorry for the inconvenience. You know, computers, you got to love them. Um, hopefully we're going to be able to fix All it. All participants are off hold. Can you hear us? If you're calling in from a phone line, um, and if you can hear us, could you please uh, could you please let us know? Okay, yes, y'all can hear us now? Okay, great. 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 I'm awesome. so sorry about that. Let's see if we can... Sorry about that. Let's resume. Okay. So that means everybody missed my beautiful speech about H1Bs. <laughs> Only a part, so <laughs> you can start on the numerical limitation, and I guess we would be okay from there. Well, okay, so assuming that there's no need to rehash the H-1B um, visa, the requirements, but we were discussing the cap, and I guess that's a great place to start off. 
Uh, the quotas 85,065 are considered regular cap, 20,000 master's cap. Cap has been met for this fiscal year. Next week or this week, we should see what the final numbers were. Last fiscal year, they had 236,000 applications received for these coveted 85,000 slots. So they proceeded to do a lottery. Um, obviously, this year we're going to be in a lottery situation again. And if your number got picked, great. If not, what alternatives do we have? And that will be our next slide. Everyone still with us? Yes. Okay, perfect. So when it's time to consider H-1B alternatives, now's the time. So you need to know kind of what your backup plan or what your plan B is. Obviously, in the upcoming months, we're going to see whether the application was selected in the cap, if you were selected in the lottery, or if it was rejected. Last year, I think we started getting them in May. The last ones trickled in in June. You get your entire packet back. You get the filing fees that were filed with that packet with a nice letter that says, I'm sorry you weren't selected in the cap. Yes, I guess some people were lucky that they got their packet uh, back in June, July, because last year I got my final, oh, the last right. H-1B visa that was rejected that I filed. Fortunately, most of the H-1B visas that I filed last year were accepted, but I had a couple of uh, petitions that unfortunately didn't win the lottery. Uh, so my last cap case rejected, I received it in October. Oh, wow, that's so right. we were waiting almost for six months to get this cap petition back with the checks and everything. So be patient because the lottery system, um, it, it, they, they first do the master's degree, they they. They then do they, the, the raffle, it's a raffle, what they do for the 20,000 visas, then whatever is left of the 20,000, the applications with masters, they put it back in the general pool of the 65,000, and then they do the lottery for everybody else, and then after that one, they start sending receipt notices, and the receipt notices usually start coming sometime at the end of April, beginning of May. Uh, we still have receipt notices getting back in, sometime in June. Mm -hmm. There's year difference is no H-1B premium processing. Right, that's so, the big difference this year. This is um, no So H1B. everybody's going to be on the slow, I'm sorry, the regular process. The regular process. Uh, yes, and so that's how it kind of works. So be patient because if you don't get a receipt notice, you will get the petition back uh, hopefully before the end of the year. Yes, hopefully, right? <laughs> um, so what happens, though, some of them that are accepted will may not pass through and they'll get denied, so that's why you want to have your backup plan, your alternate. And then if you're getting close to reaching your six-year maximum and you haven't started or haven't had a perm process started on your behalf to where you could extend beyond the six years. So um, there are several professional-type categories, um, a lot of consultants that are definitely H-1B specialty occupation, but don't necessarily have a sponsoring employer for the perm and they're about to hit that six year maximum. So if that's one of you, then you're definitely lucky that you're in on this call. Yes. Uh, so talking about alternatives, uh, definitely when you are in one of these situations, to be proactive, I always tell people, don't wait until you're in one of these situations, kind of anticipate, map your immigration, uh, uh, goals from the beginning and so you know where you need to be and when to be able to process all your petitions without major uh, problems. Now an alternative for H-1B employees, this might sound uh, redundant because you're th already thinking well if it is an H-1B why to worry about CAP? Well if the numerical limitation uh, hits and you are in one of those categories that you were never counted towards the CAP Think about the best example I can give you right now, which we do this and work with this population every day. Think about a physician who came on an H-1B visa and a residency program and is working for an institution that is not subject to the CAP. Certainly they were able to obtain an H-1B that is not that was not counted towards the CAP. So this physician at the end of the residency program uh, finds himself that he needs to either apply under the CAP program or find other options. That's an H-1B employee. Concurrent employment might work, but the other employee that we might see is one employee that was actually counted towards the CAP, but uh, left the United States 
and stay outside the United States for a year or so. And he only used two or three years of the total six years H-1B term. Well, that person can come back to the United States and use the remaining of the term. Uh, before, we used to have a rule that it said that if you were outside the United States for more than a year, then you had to reapply under the cap and you couldn't use the remaining of the H-1B visa time. That rule changed a couple years ago, and now recently in January, in January this year, when they issued the new regulations, they gave us another uh, beautiful gift where they say, well, not only you can recapture the time, uh, but also you can do it at any time. So you can apply for an H-1B to complete the whatever is left on the six years term and come back to the United States and use it at any time. You're not subject to one year, two years, or whatever. Is If you have time left on your H-1B, you only, wo you only work in the United States under a cap um, subject case, so you did it through and you were already counted towards the numerical limitation, but you left the United States three years ago and now you want to come back, you have an employer ready to employ you, come back on your H-1B, you will be able to process it for whatever is remaining in your H-1B visa. So it's six years in the U.S.? Six years in the U.S., which okay. means any time that you spent outside the United States doesn't count towards those six years. We have the case of many of our clients who, for whatever reason, mainly vacation, but they go outside the United States, spend a week here, two weeks there, one month here, another month there. And what we, at the end of the process, when we are processing the H-1B visa renewal after uh, at the time that almost the six years are up, we can recapture any time spent outside the United States. We have even had cases where we have been able to recapture six months and up to a year because of the time they spent outside the United States. It could also be working for the same employer in their foreign entity in their home country, but when they were in the United States for whatever number of months in H-1B visa, that time was used, but whatever m number of months that were they spent outside the United States, you can recapture. So always look at time spent outside the United States to kind of extend your H-1B visa uh, for the allowed time, six years. And I think that's critical, especially with them eliminating premium processing right now. You want to, before, I think employers would kind of be a little bit lax and, well, we'll recapture because we can always premium later. And with premium off the table, there's definitely a lot of planning that needs to be done ahead of time. Yeah, but uh, let me just make a, a note here because the H-1B premium processing is not eliminated. It's only suspended. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Well, a difference of opinion. <laughs> <laughs> well, but I happen to believe it's suspended temporarily, and hopefully they will reopen it before six months. Yes, so we we'll definitely see. want that. Michelle and I will get back to you on that one. Yes. See who wins. <laughs> okay. Um, so the other alternative then, um, we're talking about H-1B employees. Now, H-1B cap exempt employers. This is critical and this is key to many people who are not able to, to get into the cap uh, or, or to win the lottery. There are employers that are exempt from the cap. What that means is that those employers can file H-1B petitions with the Department of Immigration at any time during the year, and there's no limitations as to how many H-1B visas they can file. And who are these, or what employers are these? Well, you have the government research organizations and nonprofit petitioners affiliated with government research uh, institutions. Uh, institutions of higher education, universities, colleges, they are not subject to the numerical limitations. So if you have um, a job offers with one of these institutions or organizations, you will be able to, to get your H-1B uh, petition filed. Um, Nonprofit petitions, petitioners affiliated with institutions of higher education, post-secondary education institutions. Just to give you examples, when you're thinking about a nonprofit petitioner affiliated with institutions of higher education, again, because this is what we work with most of the time. Think about a hospital that teaches. It's a teaching hospital. Usually these hospitals that are nonprofit, 
not all hospitals are nonprofit, but if it is a nonprofit hospital and they have an affiliation agreement with a medical school where the resident or fellow physicians go to the hospital to train, that entity is more than likely exempt from the cap and therefore they can sponsor H-1B visa petitions at any time. Interestingly, these, uh, there were, uh, as you know, and we did a webinar uh, a couple months ago about the new regulations that came into um, effect in January. And for this specific category, because I do work with a lot of physicians and employers, for the nonprofit petitioners or that uh, are affiliated with institutions of higher education, we have been getting uh, a lot of uh, requests for evidence from the Department of Immigration. Uh, uh, what what the regulations implemented were implemented in January. Now, when we start filing these petitions, we are seeing that when it comes to these kind, these kind of um, organizations that have affiliation agreements with uh, institutions of higher education or, or teaching, or, or ed, uh, it, for example, a medical school, they are asking for documentation to show, in many cases, active active relationship. In other words, they want to see not just an affiliation agreement, but they also want to see uh, information about how many students from the uh, entity, the, the higher education entity, are enrolled in the nonprofit organization, what kind of training they are going, uh, and taking, how many students have participated from the beginning or currently. I mean, they want to see that it's not just an agreement or some sort of paper showing they have an agreement. They want to make sure they are actively training uh, students from the educational uh, institutions. So if an, anyone is filing this kind of petitions with the Department of Immigration, we are now including additional documentation to this effect because we are seeing these RFEs uh, in great numbers. Um, to satisfy them. <laughs> that there is really this a, a relationship, yes. Uh, the other a, a other uh, option for cap exempt employers, and this one uh, is, is used, but we think it could be used um, more frequently. Uh, it is for profit employers, and when you're thinking cap exempt, usually your mind goes to government research organizations, nonprofit organizations affiliated. But this one is for those employers who are for profit. And you think for profit? No, forget it. Well, the caveat here is that these for profit employers, they to be able to sponsor an H one B visa outside the the cap or the numerical limitation program they'll have to place the H-1B employee at a, at a location with an organization that is a nonprofit and that is affiliated. Let me give you an example. Uh, private practice, physicians again, I'm sorry, I'll come up with a couple of other examples for other people from other <laughs> professions, but a private employer, and I've done this and we do this very frequently, a private employer medical practice hires a physician to be a hospitalist, to work in a hospital. And the hospital happens to be nonprofit and affiliated with an organization of higher education. And the private employer decides that this physician is going to work at that location or at that hospital at least 50% of his time. With that, that private employer that is not exempt from the cap then that private employer qualifies to file the H-1B visa exempt, and so the physician can work with the private employer and then spend half of his time working at the nonprofit affiliated organization. This is a great um, uh, program, and, and it's a way to for private organizations to be able to still sponsor those uh, individuals who might be subject to the cap. And I would venture to say that we're going to start seeing a little bit more utilization of this particular uh, little caveat here in the upcoming years. Absolutely, yes. So that's for the H-1B employees, H-1B cap exempt employers. Uh, we're going to walk you through other options. Uh, Attorney Alonso will talk to you. And we call these options the alphabet soup because if you see in the uh, 
in the screen, our slide, it shows all kind of letters. And these are just some of the options. There are many other letters not applicable or the ones we're not going to address today because they do not apply to this uh, presentation or H-1B options. Mm -hmm. But um, we go from F to H to L to B to O, so uh, we'll talk to about each one of them uh, next. Okay. So um, the F one. So a lot of times and a lot of folks that applied for uh, the H-1B this upcoming for this cap for this fiscal year are an OPT and most of the time they've secured the employer who's willing to sponsor them for the H because they've probably gotten their OPT training with that particular employer. So what happens if you didn't make the cap? A lot of students will look at whether or not they have a STEM degree and if they do then if eligible they can get an additional 17 months so they'll have a total of 29 months of OPT. Uh, the employer, though, needs to be enrolled in E-Verify and, and has to agree to uh, letting, know, uh, letting the government know about the departure within 48 hours of the student. So STEM degrees are very popular because of this extension. So if timed correctly, and depending on when you start your degree program, we could look at when we would file the extension, and there's at least two H-1B lotteries you could probably apply to. If you didn't make the first one, still stay on your OPT, um, for your STEM extension and apply for the next fiscal year. So OPT, if you have a STEM degree, definitely an option. If not, though, uh, you'll see a lot of students will enroll in advanced degree programs because of that. So if you had your bachelor's, you are also looking as a backup plan to see if you were admitted for your master's program to continue your F. Mm -hmm. um, the next option would be the H-1B one. Now, this one sounds like the H-1B, and it is in that we're looking for professionals. It is not a dual intent uh, visa category like the H-1B. That's why the H-1B is so coveted, because of its dual intent nature. The H-1B one is limited, to, though, to citizens of Singapore or Chile. We know almost never meet that cap. Actually, I don't think we've ever reached that cap. Um, in its 18-month period of employment, we have filed in the past several H-1B1s because we know we'll get them in the H-1B1 category and then continue to extend them on H-1B1 while we try to get them in the H-1B regular cap so that way we can start the immigrant process uh, through PERM. So again, these are alternatives of how we can kind of get to um, the H-1B for another lottery or kind of continue your path here albeit strictly non-immigrant, no dual intent. Yes, uh, let me just add something here because if you start, if you're paying attention to the numbers, we talked about the 85,000 visas, then we said 20,000 are for master's degree, then we went down to 65 for everybody else, but then here comes the H-1B visa, H-1B one visa, and for this specific category, there are 6,800 H-1B visas that are taken out of the 65 that we mentioned. So those who are going to be in the regular H-1B pool going through the lottery, they're going to be short of 6,800. So they are actually going to be competing for 50, um, 50, I can't do that. 50, 50, 50, 50. yes. So it's, actually smaller number of visas available for regular H-1B petitions uh, because these 68 are exclusively for people from Singapore or Chile. Now here, one thing that you're going to start seeing in the different alternatives uh, that we didn't mention uh, uh, and that was a purpose with the H-1B visa category is that you're going to start seeing dependents, spouse cannot work and no dual intent. H-1B visas, for those who uh, are familiar with the H-1B visas, you know you can have dual intent, which means you can have a temporary visa and at the same time be applying or in the process of obtaining a green card. Dual intent, not a problem. Uh, certain spouses of H-1B uh, visa holders can work. We'll talk about that one later. Mm -hmm. But for the other categories, uh, many of them, you you cannot have a dual intent, which means if you are, in this case, H-1B-1 visa, uh, you cannot be at the same time processing your, H1, uh, your green card process. Or, uh, or if you do, the timing is critical because you don't want to be 
going against the intent. Exactly. And the timing meaning uh, you want to get the green card process done before you, you are up for renewal of your H-1B-1 visa, and that becomes very tricky. But the key here is what um, Michelle mentioned is the purpose of getting people and these other options like the H-1B-1 is that uh, to buy time and be able to for them to be in the United States working and at the same time when we are able to get them into the H-1B um, category so that when we are working on the green card, we're not going to have problems with the dual intent uh, restrictions. Right, and, th and this all comes down to strategy. The ideas that we're trying to strategize for, for you, um, how to get oftentimes to the green card. For folks who just want to come here professionally for a temporary period and advance their careers abroad, by all means, these are definitely excellent categories just to file and under and stay under for whatever period you need. Yes, and the H-1B is not that. H-1B-1 is not that different from the H-1B. No, not in terms of specialty same. occupation. Exactly. All those requirements mm -hmm. are the same, but it, it is this sort of um, typically ignored stepchild. Yes, you know, exactly. and, and it needs some some sort of, it, it needs to be recognized. Yes. I, I want to bring H-1B-1 back out and, and everyone get introduced to her. Yeah. Agreed. Okay, the next one, which is also like the other stepchild of the H-1B, is the E-3 visa. It is exclusively for citizens of Australia. And again, it, I say the stepchild because we require a specialty occupation um, similar to the H-1B. Those definitions have to be met. Labor condition application has to be filed with the Department of Labor. Um, the annual quota for the E-3 is 10500 we don't have 10,500 uh, 10, Australians applying under these E3, so we've and never reached... I don't reached... know why, because everybody loves the United States. So right. Come on over. <laughs> come on. <laughs> so uh, professionals from Australia, this is sometimes overlooked. I've actually run into practitioners who have only prepared an H-1B for their Australian you know, beneficiary, for, their, uh, for the employers um, that are trying to bring in these folks. And, and I, you know, I've brought up to, well, if they're from Australia, have you contemplated the E3? E3 is a very straightforward program. Again, the downside, no dual intent. Um, but spouses can work with uh, approval from USCIS. So this one definitely is something that should be uh, contemplated if you are a citizen of Australia. Yeah, and the good thing about being in one of these visas, the H-1B-1, the E-3, is that if you obtain one of these visas, you will qualify for an H-1B visa. Right. It's just to, to make the leap and, and be actually able to get one of the H-1B visas. To be visas. selected yeah, to, in that coveted cap. To win the lottery. Yes. There you go. Try your luck. Okay. The TN visa, uh, that's another option, again, specifically to nationals of this one in our Mexico and Canada, and this visa is based on the NAFTA treaty, uh, NAFTA agreement between the three countries, the United States, Canada, and Mexico. Uh, similar to the H-1B visa in terms of specialty occupation, occupations or professions, there's a list of occupation uh, provided in the NAFTA agreement, and only those occupations in that list qualify for um, TM visas. Uh, most of those occupations require bachelor's degree, some of them don't, uh, so not necessarily because you qualify for a TM visa, you will qualify for an H-1B. Pay attention to the requirements for the specific degree or occupation. It is granted for a three-year uh, term, but it can be renewed Indefinitely. Yes, and, and that's, and again, depending, uh, right now, Mexico has a one-year visa. Um, and, and so, reciprocity. Uh, for, because of reciprocity. So uh, oftentimes, depending on your travel, we'll do the, the TM visa, but then do the extension here in the interior to get the full three years. But what I've been doing with some of my TM clients, and it's been working very well, is even though you go outside and, and you get the visa for only one year at the consulate when you come come in, you can ask the officers at the port of entry to give you the uh, stay or the I-94 form for three years, and many of them do. So once you come in and you have an I-94 to allow you to stay here for three years, then you're good. 
Uh, but that's that's not everybody does that, and, and we've right. been lucky to get them done that way. And there are some changes that defer inspections at different ports of entry. So we've seen a little bit of a, a flux on how these requests are being handled more recently. I'm currently dealing with um, a port of entry that changed the way they're proceeding on these corrections. So, again, you just have to work with an attorney who can work out with deferred inspection, how to get these corrections done yeah. on your I-94. Now, one thing, and, and a word of caution with this TN visas, yes, they can be extended and renew unlimited uh, for a limited time, but be mindful of how long and how many times have you extended or renew your TN visa with the same employer. Uh, and, and the reason I mention this is because at some point, um, you officers may start questioning how temporary is the TM visa when you have been working with the same employer for 10, 15 years, still on a temporary visa, and they might start looking into, okay, temporary is only for a certain time. And so not that it's, we don't see that a problem at first, but then at some point they may start questioning the temporariness of the visa. And we've seen some of those officers at the consulate who also say, well, what are your ties here in, for example, Mexico? Exactly, because when they, when we talk about no dual intent means that you, during the uh, duration of the visa, this case is TN or the e, uh, H3 or the H1B1, uh, you are supposed to have the intention to go back to your home country. And how the Department of Immigration knows that uh, you have that intention, what usually is based on tides to your home country. And for people who have been here in the United States for many, many, many years, uh, they may not have a home to go back to. Family may already be in the United States. So, they, so don't sell your house to come in on a TN or yes, close your account. But look for ways to continue to show ties or the intention to go back. Um, okay, so we now have the E2 visa, the treaty investor. This is a great option. If we have a treaty with your home country. Correct. So the E2, there's a, there's a trader visa and a treaty investor visa. Um, here we talk about more to the treaty investor. Trade is, is, is also related. Um, but most of the people that we get calls from are those who have the ability they're looking for startups they're they're trying to maybe start something here so we'll look at first are you from a country that we have a treaty to engage in in the invest in the investment but, but let me just also make uh, a, a comment that for trader you are looking at usually the department of immigration looks for trade during the last year so you have the person has to have some sort of history to show consistent in volume right. in terms of trade but when the in for the investor visa which is the option that we contemplated for the h1b you just need to be able to have the money to invest and other uh, uh, requirements that will not require you to start working on this a year before you can apply exactly so a lot of times we have done the e2 and then transition to the e1 only because the requirements for the e1 are a little bit lesser, but again, whether it's the E2 treaty investor or trader, um, the requirements for the treaty investor, which would be the most logical leap from, say, F1, OPT, mm -hmm. to, and you didn't get your lottery cap, you look at, well, do I have some seed money, and can I make this business venture work? Open my own business. Exactly, mm -hmm. and we have a lot of very entrepreneurial-minded uh, folks that are graduating from, uh, you know, university here and abroad that want to come here and bring their ideas, and this is definitely going to be the category that we need to discuss uh, at length with them. Again, no dual intent, but the bonus is if we do secure the E-2, yeah, the spouses can get employment authorization, and a lot of times for these, sp uh, these startup companies will have the spouse get the employment authorization so they can start working on the same venture, and, and that goes to show the W-2s and, and just personnel uh, we work with a couple different vendors about uh, the business investment side of this. So this would definitely be an alternative to consider. Yes, but, but a key to this petition is not just having the money, being able to create your own company and, and, and do everything, all the necessary steps to show that you are in the process of investing in a real uh, operating enterprise, but also the Department of Immigration looks at the person's uh, background and experience because if, if the person can show that it has the ability to manage the business, 
that might be an issue because the Department of Immigration wants people who will be successful and will successfully manage a, a company that is going to, to grow. Right, so we do need to show the link to where the E2 applicant is going to come in to direct and develop this E2 um, business enterprise. Yes. Uh, that brings us to the H3 visa for trainees. Uh, this visa sounds um, easier than it is. Uh, because uh, trainee and everybody's thinking, oh, we can all do that. Well, easy, right? Easy, easy. <laughs> uh, the trainee uh, training can be in any field of endeavor, not available in home country. So one of the things that uh, will have to be demonstrated when you are uh, completing this petition is that whatever training you're going to come to do in the United States, whoever is going to sponsor this, you would not be able to have the same training back home. Uh, so you need to come and train in the United States with this specific person or program or under the specific circumstances. Uh, the, the, the trainee position cannot be part of the company operations, meaning one more job in the company. No, this is exclusive to people to train. So it's not just a job. Uh, not productive employment, we go to, cannot be part of the company op uh, operations because whoever comes as a trainee is not supposed to be paid or compensated uh, in uh, as an employee. If there is compensation incidental to the training, it has to be justified because as incidental to to the training, but not as payment or compensation for for the work done. Uh, because they're supposed not to. You're not supposed to be doing any work. You're supposed to just be training. Uh, it's a two-year maximum period of employment, again, training, no extensions. So once you're done with the two years, you're done. Uh, it's a very limited visa, um, and, and the things, and when I have worked on these petitions, I, uh, the, the information and documentation from the trainee is not as extensive as the documentation and information from the entity that is offering the training because part of the uh, uh, the conditions or the requirements is that the, the company, the person, or the entity offering the training, they have to have a training program. That means that when you file these petitions with the Department of Immigration, you have to have brochures and schedule of classes, uh, the theory and, and practical classes that the person who is going to be training is going to be engaged in to learn. Like the training um, manual. Like the, the training manual. And, and uh, they even ask for pictures. So you have to include pictures showing the training facilities, the materials, the tools, everything that the person is going to be using in terms of accomplishing the training. So and the part of the sponsoring uh, organization, it requires uh, an extensive, uh, extensive documentation to show they have an adequate uh, training program uh, to sponsor that person to come to the United States to train. Um, the L1 transferees. This L1 is for companies to transfer employees from an entity or an affiliated uh, branch or entity outside the United States. Uh, any country is not related to any um, uh, trade, uh, any agreement any, with any country. It's just based on the company having a, another company outside the United States and so that they can bring those employees outside to the United States for to learn, to kind of get used with the company uh, here in the United States so that can eventually they can eventually go back and, and train other employees. However, this one doesn't require uh, intention to go back home. This one is like the H-1B visa. You can be here on a uh, transfer visa for NL, but at the same time be processing uh, your green card process uh, um, petitions. It, uh, the requirements is for an employee from a foreign country uh, for a foreign company to be transferred to the United States have to have been working with the company outside the United States for at least one year in a uh, executive or manage, managerial position or to have a specialized knowledge. But it had 
it has to have the records, usually with payroll records and other sort of records to show the person did work with that company within the last three years before he entered the United States for a full year. Um, and if the person comes on a uh, executive or manager L1A visa, then the term of the visa is for seven years. But if it comes in the L1B, specialized knowledge, the term is only for five years. Uh, and, and what you are looking for here is if the, in, if the purpose is for the person to eventually stay in the United States, well, then try to do the green card process during the duration of these visas. Because these ones, as opposed to the H-1B visa that at some point you might extend beyond the six years, you cannot extend the L visas beyond the five or the seven years. Uh, spouses may work with government authorization, that's the employment authorization document, that's the good thing, and they can work with anyone. It's not subject to a specific employer. Through the L visa, for those who want to know, uh, if you are here in an L1A executive or manager visa, then you are, you are probably, or not probably, you will be eligible to process your green card petition through the multinational executive managers. And usually when we do this type of visas, immediately after the person comes in and the L1A visa, we kind of start working on the process of the green card uh, so we can get that done in a couple of years rather than eternity. Right, that's why the L1A is, is coveted, but again, that's also why it gets a lot of scrutiny uh, because it's such a clear path to the green card. So again, you know, we work with you to make sure that that is prepared from the very beginning to where we can strategize and move on to exactly. the one. Mm -hmm. So another alternative to the H-1B, and I just had a meeting with someone this morning about it, is the O-1 uh, Alien of Extraordinary Ability Visa. Um, you must show... This is a beauty. I love this one. This yes, is great. I love it. And I like it, too, because it's a great primer, again, for possibly an EB-1. Now, there is this false um, rumor notion that if you qualify for an O-1, you automatically qualify for an EB-1. That's not the case. But it is good testing ground for an EB-1. So you may be able to avoid um, the PERM process. Again, though, it depends. It's always very case-specific. They're very close together in terms of requirements. They read identical yes. in a lot of ways. Yes, but not necessarily because you have an O-1, you automatically will qualify for an EB-1. Be, be mindful of that. Uh, when you are strategizing how you're going to get your green card, you might have to be here on an O-1 visa for a little bit mm -hmm. to strengthen your uh, uh, curriculum and cr credentials so that you will be up for an EB-1 within a reasonable time. Right, and, and that is, and again, the case I had just this morning, um, the, the person is of such national and international acclaim in her particular field of endeavor. It's excellent. Now, we're going through all of the accolades and everything to find out whether or not we can transition strictly uh, to the EB-1 after we secure the O-1. The scrutiny that you're going to get on an EB-1 is really the, the most important part because the O-1 is non-immigrant. Uh, again, we're, we're talking non-immigrant intent versus dual intent. O-1 is non-immigrant. When you're done, you're going to go back. But when you transition from O-1 to EB-1, while the requirements read almost the same, the scrutiny that you're going to be put under is going to be significantly uh, higher mm -hmm. and different. The standard is higher. Right. So overall evidence must show that the applicant has risen to the top of the field. Um, an employer is required. You cannot self-petition on an O. And there is this uh, peer consultation uh, expert advisory opinion requirement that's there. In certain circumstances, you can waive it. Um, but we, we look at the entire thing, and an itinerary needs to be submitted. It's a three-year initial period of employment. Um, we can get extensions thereafter. There's no limit, but spouses cannot work. So if you are of, um, you know, this, of a distinction in your particular field, then the O-1 is definitely going to be an option that we should explore for you. Mm -hmm. The next one, and I'm not a particular fan of it because it's so misunderstood, and when I say it's so misunderstood, it's mis misunderstood by CBP, Department of State, by, by everyone. And I even have heard um, colleagues who don't really quite um, know how to address this. But the, the, the B-1 business visa in lieu of the H-1B, mm -hmm. it's this, um, <laughs> you can bring from a foreign subsidiary someone over here. But the big caveat is they can come and do H-1B type work, but they can't be paid by the U.S., Employer, And as a matter of fact, 
they, will pay in the United States. They can't be paid here. They have to be paid, paid from the foreign yeah. country. And there can't be any sourcing of funds from the U.S. to the foreign country for payment here. We've seen that come up. Um, the the ones that are mostly available for this are, are those who don't have U.S. affiliate companies, but they need the particular person to come over and do that H-1B type work. Um, that's where you'll get the notation. It's an annotation on the bottom of the visa. It'll say the H-1B in lieu, or in lieu of the H-1B, to allow them to take and engage in this kind of work. Um, but if you are dealing with a U.S. company, they bring the employee from that foreign subsidiary or affiliate to do this type of work. Um, the term is up to one year. Again, no dual intent. Uh, and it's strictly for the type of work that was identified. Yeah, this is, like you said, I, we are not fan of this B1 not visa, <laughs> not only because it's misunderstood, but also it is abused. Uh, and, and it's kind of a hybrid, but it, in a bad way, with the L visa, the H visa. It's like one of those things that they really didn't know what to do, and they came up with a B1. Because you, the person, the company has to have a company outside the United States, or there goes the L. But... For some reason, that person can be transferred to the United States mm -hmm. as an L, so they bring that person in a B-1 for a specific project only for a year, but it's not going to be working like an H employee. They're not getting So a not getting paid yeah. here by outside, in, outside the United States. So it, it is, it has to, it is doable, sounds easier than doing an H and doing an L, but if if you're able to get an B-1 visa and you have to go to the consulate with an extensive letter explaining what you're going to be doing, why and how, so that you can come in on a B visa, B-1 visa uh, for the full year, then once in the United States, uh, you need to be careful not to cross the line and be doing what H-1B employees do or L-1 visa employees do or get money here exactly. in the United States. It's walking a fine line for, for the time you're going to be on that B-1 visa. Agreed. Not a fan, but it's it has to be mentioned. Yes. And it's an option. People use it, like I said, use it and abuse it, uh, it, it but it's there. It's an option. Uh, and it might be used in cases of companies really needing someone to come to work on a project and they don't have the luxury of doing an L or miss the H-1B cap season. 